Hi, it's Tony Chapman. I'm the host of the podcast and radio show, Chatter That Matters. 2008, something very special happened to me. I was inducted into the Marketing Hall of Legends. It's one of the proudest moments of my career and because my family was there, one of the proudest moments of my life. See, in this hall are people that have put a dent in the marketplace. Visionaries who came up with ideas for businesses that are not only established in Canada, but sometimes around the world. Stewards of brands who found a way to engage the head, heart, and hands of the consumer. Mentors and leaders and creators who built campaigns that danced across all media. But this is more than just the Hall of Legends. It's also the Hall of Learning. Every legend who walks in is shouldering an overflowing knapsack packed with experiences, insights, and ideas that when shared can inspire us all to do more and to be more. And that brings me to today. AMA Toronto has asked me to host a series called The Legends Journey, Lessons in Leadership. The idea is that we're gonna take some of the experiences that are in that hall, draw them out and bring them to you. In each episode, I will chat with a legend and then ask them to share some of their journey and what they've learned along the way. Joining me today is Arlene Dickinson. Not only is she one of the most popular Canadians, she's certainly one of the most popular members to be in the Marketing Hall of Legends. She went in in 2014. Arlene, you might know, is the matrix of the Dragon's Den. She's a fearless entrepreneur. She's reinvented herself, a very successful author and speaker, an incredible philanthropist. Arlene, that's quite an introduction and one certainly well-deserved. Welcome. It, it is, Tony. Thank you. I'm blushing over here. So thank you for that. That was uh, super kind and it's my pleasure to be here. I, I, I love the AMA and everything that uh, this stands for. So thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak to you. Fantastic. So Arlene, a lot of people really would frame you as just absolutely gifted, that everything you touch turns to gold. But when I interviewed you for my podcast, we talked a lot about you at age 31, single mother, not very well educated, no prospects. How did you go from sort of a career in desperation to one that's truly a career of celebration? You know, I think it, it starts, it, just like anything in marketing, it starts with kind of understanding what's going on around you and also understanding who you are. And, and I think, you know, the reason marketing was such a good career for me and what got me going in my career was that I really wanted to pay attention to what other people were feeling and thinking. And, you know, many times today we rely so much on research and not enough on what really is happening around us and thinking about what's going on inside of people's psyches that we have, we, we lose sight of the opportunity to grow. So for me, my career is being shaped around caring about people, um, wanting them to be successful, people around me to be successful, leveraging what I know to support them with that um, effort and not thinking about how do I get successful. And, and that's worked for me. It's worked for me to care about other people's success first. And you speak a lot about that in your books. And if you were to kind of give us a highlight reel of these bestsellers and truly are, uh, you know, people not just buy the books, but actually read them, what, what would be the highlight reel? What would be the sort of the lessons that we would take away from reading each one of the, uh, the ones you penned? Um, in my book, Persuasion, it was about, you know, believing in a couple basic principles that, you know, you should be genuine and authentic if you want to persuade people. You should be honest and you should believe in a win-win. I mean, these are characteristics, I think, that help you be persuasive. If you, uh, if you have to, you know, debate with somebody in order to win or to conquer or to be, you know, somehow the victor, then I think you lose the whole dynamic of what can happen when, again, you bring people along on that road journey with you. Um, my book All In was really about the life of being an entrepreneur and how much you sacrifice. So the lesson in that book was really about understanding that we have impact on the people around us when we're entrepreneurs. We, we sometimes lose sight of the impact we have because we can be so absorbed in building and seeing our vision through that we forget about our family and our friends and our, you know, our community. And so, you know, that book was all about really understanding that you can be all in with your business, but still have an opportunity um, to recognize that you need to be present with those who you love. The third book, Reinvention, was really about how you know, we can get complacent in life and in business. And for me, I had run my marketing firm for many years. I was successful in business. I had had a good career and a flood basically, you know, changed everything for me. And it's what you do with those, those challenges, those crises that happen in your life, the things that actually take you off course, learning how to turn those into ways to think forward is really something that I believe life is all about. 
And so reinvention is about this notion that we shouldn't have to wait for a crisis or a catastrophe to think about what we want to do with our lives and who we want to be. But often it is that that becomes the catalyst. And so reinvention is all about, you know, understanding that and understanding how you can reinvent yourself at any given time in your life. And Arlene, when we talked about your early stages of your career, you, you mentioned that you come into Toronto as this, this, you know, woman-owned Cal Calgary agency, and you felt intimidated and it felt like you were an imposter. But one day that switch went on. And what advice can you give to people in the audience to be less preoccupied about what you think are the, the, the competitive forces and much more focused on what you're saying and what you can control and what's inside you? Yeah, Tony, I remember walking into um, the boardroom for the um, ICA at the time and, you know, surrounded by legends, you know, and, 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 and truly legends. Um, many of them, you know, very few of them were self-employed. Many of them worked for the organizations they represented and feeling just so like, oh, I've got the small agency in Calgary and who do I think I am? And I don't have a degree in marketing. And again, who do I think I am? And and it was the turning point for me was when I was watching and observing, you know, kind of what the conversations were about and realizing that it all came down to kind of an ego contest. Um, and, and I don't mean this offensively. So I hope anyone who was in that room who's listening to this is going to take this offensively. But it really was a bit of an ego contest. And I just thought, you know, I can play there and I'll never succeed. I'll never win. I, I can't that's not the table I'm setting for myself. I just have to be good at what I know. And I have to represent what I stand for and, and the small shop in Calgary and what it's like to be a regional shop. And as soon as I understood that, that they didn't know what I knew, that they didn't have my view, that they possibly couldn't understand how um, the challenges I was going through. As soon as I understood that, I thought, you know, I, I do have a voice and my voice is fine and I can use it. And and it was at that moment that it all kind of clicked over for me. And I went, ah, you know what? I may be insecure personally, but I'm never going to be insecure professionally. And that was that was the moment. Is that what prepared you for uh, Kevin O'Leary on Dragon's Den? Because it took you about <laughs> two shows before he was the puppet on uh, on your string. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, again, you can't you can't be uh, you can't find yourself so intimidated that you lose your voice and that was something my dad always taught me which is we have our free agency we have a right to our opinions and we have a right to voice them and as he does so do I and I don't have to agree with everybody else's opinion and nobody has to agree with mine but I'm sure as heck gonna say it and I'm gonna say what I believe whether somebody likes it or not. Arlene you and I are both sort of small business owners that have competed against the multinationals I think we're both advocates for this incredible sector of our economy what advice can you bring to small business owners today that they that they can compete, that they can succeed, that there's still an incredible place and path for them to follow? It's, you know, it's been a very difficult time for small business owners over the course of the pandemic. And um, what I saw in the entrepreneurs and the small business owners that I didn't see in the large corporations was this ability to change and shift and reinvent themselves to accommodate what was going on. So whether it was meal kit deliveries going out the back door of restaurants, whether it was people that were manufacturing bathing suits suddenly becoming manufacturers of masks, whether it was people who were creating alcohol, had alcohol um, manufacturing facilities who turned it into hand sanitizer. You saw these, you know, entrepreneurs finding a way forward and that, that innovation, that spirit of let's figure out what we can do with what we have using their hands and their hearts and their, you know, their teams, that is what makes a small business owner successful. Not, you know, that what big companies won't ever be able to do. They can't move fast enough. They can't think fast enough. They don't know how to innovate the same way. That's the difference. So hold on to that because that's, what's going to be that, what rockets you into the future. And is it fair to say the small business owners that find a way to reinvent and reimagine when they look back in the career, just like you look back at the time the flood almost drowned your business, that those are some of your finest moments. Those are the moments that you're going to take and say, look what I did and accomplish. And, and, and that probably the most meaningful part. You know, when I look back at my life, it is the moments when I had the darkest times that became the moments that defined me and help shape me. So I always say that your past doesn't um, define you. It just shapes and informs you. And, you know, but it, it doesn't, you can be anything. So yeah, I, I just, 
Yeah. You know, you talked earlier about, you know, the serving others and helping others. And I've seen you speak, you're an extraordinary speaker. But what really impresses me is after the talk, everybody wants to have a piece of Arlene and you stick around and you listen and you and you give them advice. So knowing that mentorship is sort of uh, the lifeblood of AMA, really the sense of passing yeah. knowledge back and forth. What's your what's your advice in terms of how people can become that generous mentor and what do they get out of it by by investing some of the experiences and currency they've earned along the way and passing it on to the next generation? I don't know, Tony, if it's age or what it is, but as I've as I've gotten older, I've really thought a lot about this question around what what does giving back mean? You know, I mean, we can give in charities, we can volunteer our time, we can, you know, we can support and help people inside of our organizations. But ultimately, you know, this idea, a notion of mentorship being an opportunity that's available to us at any given moment in time. In other words, there's always a chance, whether you're walking by a homeless person, you stop and actually address them as a human and talk to them. You know, is that classical mentorship? No, that's just humanity. But these are the moments that we can have where we can actually help people. And so for me, mentorship, if you bring it down to its base roots, it's about helping. Um, it can happen at any moment in any time of the day, somebody who you see struggling um, with a problem, somebody who you see feeling self-defeated, somebody who you see feeling um, depressed and alone. These things are all around us all the time. And so it's turning on your own empathy filter. It's starting to, it's starting to look at the human and not at just you know, walking by and not seeing them. It's that that actually provides the chance for us to mentor. And so mentorship is something that can happen anywhere, anytime with anybody. And it doesn't have to come from high up above. Like, you know, I don't need to be mentored by some, you know, super successful person. I just need to be able to talk to the person right next to me and ask them, hey, what's the hardest thing you've ever gone through in life? And they're likely going to share a story with me that's going to impact me and help me to learn and grow. And, and to me, that's successful mentoring. That's where you really have, I think, you can make a difference. You know, our industry, where you're talking about really empathy and focusing on helping others, I would suggest that our industry is very preoccupied with winning glass awards, uh, going after anything that moves. Do you think we spend too much time looking for validation from each other and not enough time putting that kind of creative talent to work to, to improve the planet, do more? pro bono work? Yeah, I, I mean, that's a great question. I think the industry is preoccupied with awards. It is preoccupied. And, and, and we all know that award shows are never as clean and, and easy as, you know, we want them to be. Um, so should we spend more time on pro bono? Yes. Should we spend more time on just supporting our communities that support us? Yes. Should we be you know, less engaged with the winning awards as validation, more engaged with helping our clients be successful. Absolutely. This is where I get really, you know, I get irritated by, you know, the creative, I, we won all these awards. That's awesome. It means you're doing good creative work, but did you actually move the needle? And I know there are awards that recognize moving the needle as well, but ultimately it doesn't matter if you win those awards either. It only matters if your clients want to stick with you and stay with you and believe that you're actually going to be their partner versus somebody who's just trying to win an award. One of our younger members, and there's, you know, this industry, this whole association is very much volunteer based, a gentleman named Faisan Sujat. And Faisan is a, is a, a new, new, new to Canada. And he wanted to ask you a question about reinvention, knowing how many times you've reinvented yourself. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the Calgary flood. And he says, I've only got certain skills. What's your advice for me to take advantage of the skills that I've been given and use them to chart a new path? You know, I think um, the four steps of reinvention are pretty straightforward. One of them is that you have to do a lot of retrospection. You have to think about, you know, the gifts that you have, the lessons you've learned, the, the experiences that you loved in your life that you want to take forward with you. Because too often as humans, we don't want to look backwards. We only want to think forwards. So thinking about kind of your lessons you learned, thinking about your core purpose in life, you know, why do you get out of bed every day? And then thinking about what it is you're talented at. And everyone's talented at something. And if he has certain gifts and use those gifts to think about what, what you've loved in your life so far, what gets you out of bed every day, what you're good at, and then think about the context of the world. How do you apply all that and what's going on in today's world? And, and so to him, I would say, you, it's great that you recognize that you have gifts. 
Now, how are you going to apply them and make the difference into delivering on your why in life? You know, like that's where the connection is. The connection isn't just take your gift and make money. The connection is how does your gift allow you to, you know, realize the dream you have, the why you have, the, what gets you out of bed every day? And how does it do it in today's world? And so I would just tell them to connect your gift to your why and look around you and see how you can apply it. It's almost a, a build on a quote that's on your website where you say something to think of the fact is we're all capable of achieving what we want if we believe in ourselves. That's yeah, a, that, I mean, that's a powerful statement, especially as you said at age 31, it was tough to believe in yourself. But over time, you recognize that you had some incredible skills and you're suggesting that just about everybody within them has the ability to do more and be more. Everybody. I mean, there, you know, um, uh, Seth Godin spoke at a, at a conference I was at and he used a great technique and it's one that I would share with you right now, Tony, and, and to the to the listeners. You know, he, he said to everybody in the room, I want you to put your hand up as high as you possibly can. And so people were sitting around at the tables in the banquet room where he was giving the speech. And of course, everybody put their hand up, you know, like this, you know, high. And then uh, he looked around. He said, that's great. He said, now I want you to put it up even higher. And you know what? Every single person in that room found a way to either inch their hand up that much higher. They stood up, they stood on the table, they did whatever they could, and they found a way to reach higher. And that first time when we put our hand up, we temper ourselves. We, we, we tell ourselves we don't dare dream and reach as high as we possibly can. Who do we think we are? We're timid. We're afraid other people are going to see us putting our hand up high. Put your hand up as damn high as you possibly can because it is your life. It is your dream. It is your passion. It is your vision. And so, you know, this notion that you have to do things to please others that you are always in the context of thinking what others think about how high you stand, the tall poppy syndrome, forget that. That is one day you're going to go back and say, why did I give a red rat's ass what anybody else thought about how high I put my hand up? So 2014, you get into the hall and a lot of people go to the hall of legends. I guess your career is over. You've been really busy. What have you been up to since you went in the hall and what can we expect next from uh, Arlene Dickinson? Well, um, first of all, I want to say, you know, I talked about awards earlier and, and when the AMA, when I, when I got the marketing hall of legends award, I honestly, I was, I was totally blown away. I had no, it, it was something I didn't even dare dream that I could get because I knew some of the winners and I didn't believe I would ever be in that group. So I, I was very grateful to have the acknowledgement, very humbled by it. And, you know, yeah, you do, you start to think, I remember getting the um, Lifetime Achievement Award when I was in my 40s. And I thought, really? That's, <laughs> wait, I just, got, I've got a long way ahead of me to go here. So I am a big believer in age, not being a definer of energy or enthusiasm or opportunity. Um, I think uh, as I've aged, you know, maybe I'm a little slower in some things, you know, I can't do cartwheels anymore, but my mind is still incredibly engaged and I want to accomplish so much. I love life so much. And so for me right now, I'm focusing on supporting businesses in the food and uh, health and personal care space and the consumer goods space in Canada. We've created an ecosystem called Venture Park, which has marketing and, and a fund attached to it. And it's it's just been, it's so rewarding. We've helped hundreds of companies. We've last year, they've done hundreds and millions of dollars in revenue into the Canadian economy, thousands of jobs. It's just, it's kind of the epitome of what I believe in, which is helping others be successful and helping our country continue to compete globally. So I know I've got a long road ahead of me. I hope um, God willing and the, and the river doesn't rise or whatever that's saying is. <laughs> um, but uh I, I, uh, I hope I can continue to make a difference in our country. I put a post up yesterday from a, a, a philosopher, sort of a Buddhist, and he talked about people that have this incredible zest for life. And you're certainly one of them. They said they were focused on three things. One, they, have, they think about death a lot, not yeah. because they're worried about dying, but they realize that at one day it'll be over. So take advantage of everything you have to do today. Like just do not squander yeah. a moment. Second thing was that the devil's in the detail. You know, he talked about loving his morning cup of coffee, but he said, drink it while he was on his email. And now he's going, if that's what I love, I'm going to take my time and think about the beans and think about the flavor and the taste. Uh, and then the third thing was just always finding that new tightrope. Be gra grateful 
you still have the intellectual and emotional capacity to chase new things. And it sounds like you have all three of those nailed because it's, it's really defines who you are. So it's, it's incredibly inspirational. If you, that old saying, if you're not a little bit afraid every day, then you're not doing, uh, you know, you're not, you're not trying hard enough. So I think that's true. My final question, Arlene, is you talk a lot about uh, putting yourself in situations where you can be curious, you can immerse, you've, you've talked about travel, how important it is, you know, taking a different route to work, just your ability to open your mind and your eyes to seeing different things. In this world where everybody's feeling closed in and, and we're, we're, we're getting this sense of, uh, 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 you know, this negative energy and insecurity and impossibility and the media is just bombarding with us, what advice can you bring to the next generation that's saying, despite all of that, there's a silver lining regardless of how dark the cloud is? Uh, the, the timing for that question is so, it's so, you know, evident. I mean, there's a, a fear versus greed um, indicator. I don't know if you've ever seen this. There's a graph that people are, that is published weekly on, you know, is fear overcoming greed, is greed overcoming fear? And fear is overcoming greed uh, for sure right now. And which is, you know, you can debate that the, neither one of those are good things, by the way. And, you know, don't want to be so afraid and so greedy that you can't live a life that's uh, fulfilling. And I, I think what I would say to everybody who's thinking about, you know, concern is to be to be two things I, I would say to be unafraid to be courageous um, we need courage right now and we need to dig deep in our courage and we need to be able to realize that humans can overcome you know this notion that you know everything's going to end and, and mankind is going to be the end of mankind you if you believe that then you're never going to go get up every day and and try and go forward. So you have to have courage. And then you also have to have creativity. I, I'm a big believer. And, you know, as we're inside our own homes, as we're on screens, instead of seeing people, you know, this notion of creativity, of play, of learning how to get back into your own mind so that you can uncover potential. This, I think, is a lost art. And we play better when we play with others, but we can play by ourselves with our thinking, with our drawing, with our expression of art, with our um, communication skills, writing things down, thinking about how the world could be better. What can you do to make it better? Creativity and courage, I think, are key to being able to get through um, what are troubling times. But these times will pass and they will get better. And I'm I'm 100% sure of that. I'm not 80% sure of that. I'm 100% sure of that. So the first thing that I really love is the fact that you stop worrying about how other people set their table. And you said it was time that this is how I want to set my table. I think that's incredibly powerful advice for people that are coming into this world, especially marketing where you could feel intimidated is you've got a lot that you can bring that other people might not have, or certainly people are going to value. The second thing is what your dad taught you about having your own voice. But I also think that from your parents, they also learned about empathy, that you, you are just a mm -hmm. beautiful human being that mm -hmm. always wants to help others get to where they want to go. And the last thing that just came up uh, in the last part of our conversation is this need today more than ever for humans to have both courage, creativity, and get conviction that, you know what, we are capable of making this place a better world. And marketers are, are capable of creating brands and, and building brands that really uh, chase more than profit, but have a higher purpose. So for all, right. all of that and more, and just for you being such a wonderful human being, I'm so honored to be your friend. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Tony. It's always a great pleasure to talk to you.